a property developer's hunting ground, and the Chinese had their eyes on it. The decision making was very sudden and very quick, however, at no point was it reckless. About a decade ago, top Chinese developers like Poli, Greenland, Yuhu, Wanda and Country Garden entered Australia, snapping up major development sites, office buildings and shopping malls. This is one circular key here in Sydney, arguably the most prestigious and high profile development site. It was purchased by Chinese interests with the view of doing a big project. Former commercial real estate agent Mark Weisel helped facilitate the boom. Development site specific over the period 2009 to say 2016 amassed over $8 billion directly to mainland Chinese developers. But with the troubles emerging at home, soon came an exodus. Wanda sold this Harbourview site to another Chinese developer in 2018, and now it's in the hands of Landlease and Mitsubishi. Greenland sold a site in Erskineville in inner Sydney for $350 million in 2022. The same year, Polly pulled the plug on three major projects in Sydney and Melbourne. And now, Country Garden is selling portions of its Wilton Greens project and the Windermere estate. Analysts say these sales will hold up development, impacting the number of new homes coming onto the market. Chinese property developers have had a tendency in the past to build high-density dwellings. The, the apartment towers, that's what they're extraordinarily good at. It does mean that those high-density towers that we actually do need, we'll see less of those over the next two to five years. After almost two decades of housing boom, Beijing introduced a series of measures to crack down on the sector, including limiting the amount developers can borrow. That caused the property bubble to burst. China's property sector has contracted since the second half of 2021, so this is the longest downtrend that we've observed since late 1990s when China was trying to restructure the sector. Country Garden recently posted a record first half year loss of $11 billion and is at serious risk of defaulting. The world's most indebted property developer Evergrande has lost more than 99% of its share value. The big developers are basically experiencing a bit of a cash crunch. So when they run off or running short on cash, one of the ways to raise cash was to, um, you know, is to sell some of the assets. Um, and preferably in a market which they can still get reasonable value. Country Garden's Australian branch Riesland has told the ABC depositors' money is safe and is held in a trust fund. But while Chinese developers say they're committed to their projects here, Beijing wants them to turn the focus back home. China's property sector accounts for more than a quarter of its GDP. The downturn has damaged the nation's post-pandemic recovery and forced Beijing to act. Home buyers in big cities can put down as little as a 30% deposit compared to up to 80% previously. But economists say interest rates are still too high. We do think that there is a need for China to continuously cut its policy rate. A much needed boost for a flagging economy. Exporters are hoping for a reset of relations with China when the Prime Minister visits Beijing later this year. China has scrapped the ban on barley, but the dispute over wine and lobsters is ongoing. Senior Fellow for East Asia at the Lowy Institute, Richard McGregor, has just returned from last week's Australia-China high-level dialogue in Beijing and joined me earlier. Welcome. How is the prospect of Anthony Albanese's visit being interpreted on the ground in Beijing? Well, I think the Chinese want it. Uh, that's clear enough. They extended the invitation. It took Australia a little bit longer to actually decide to take it up and at what time. Uh, and so clearly, I think, you know, the Chinese government has many problems at the moment with its domestic economy. It also has many problems off offshore, particularly with America, but also recently with South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines. I think they would want um, more friends than enemies. They've got enough enemies. Uh, and I think that's the real reason why uh, Australia has been invited. Secondly, uh, I think the, the signal that the poor Australia relationship was sending to the rest of the world wasn't doing them any good. So why not uh, talk? The former Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reportedly said Australia's keenness to restore relations with China would be seen as being concessional and acquiescent. 
How would that be viewed by the exporters who are locked out of China, the wine and lobster exporters? Well, there's a number of things to say about that. The first thing is if we are acquiescing, where are we acquiescing? I can't really see it. Uh, there's certainly the tone of the debate has changed. We're not having a daily punch-up with Beijing. But in terms of policy, there's been a lot of continuity from Mr Morrison's time. We're continuing with AUKUS. We're doing you know, sea exercise, naval sea exercises off the Philippines and the like. So there's no big change. I do sense, though, amongst the more hawkish elements in the Australia-China debate, a little bit of anxiety about... Uh, uh, the, the way the government is, you know, stepping up another level to go to Beijing. Exporters, um, yeah, I guess the exporters uh, aren't happy with that characterisation of the relationship, but we shouldn't really mould our policy uh, in such a transactional way around exports. Not all exporters are in the same basket. Why didn't China touch Australia's iron ore exports? Well, they can't get it from anywhere else at such a good price. If they really wanted to hurt us, they would stop iron ore and they'd be happy to do it, but they're not going to self-harm. That's the basic reason for it. You look at all the times China has used its trade power for punitive purposes, they don't self-harm because they, want it, they don't want it to impact on their economy. So that's why they didn't touch something like iron ore. They need it. When do you see the end of the export bans? It's impossible to tell. There are two really big outstanding commodities, wine and lobsters. Uh, wine won't uh, go forward until we get a draft World Trade Organization WTO decision on that. As Australia expects it to be in its favor. But the Chinese are sort of saying, oh, we've got a big wine industry at home. They do domestically these days. So don't expect anything to happen quickly there. But it depends on the decision uh, out of Geneva. Lobsters, I don't know why there has been no movement on that, but I suspect that might come with the Lunar New Year, early uh, 2024. It appears President Xi has decided now is the time to re-engage with Australia. Is that the case? Yes, and I think it's primarily... A Chinese decision. You know, the relationship is getting better because China has decided it would get better. You know, uh, I think we're a bit of a price taker in that respect in the relationship, which is why we have to be so careful about uh, how we manage this. But yes, these decisions come from the top in China. It wouldn't have happened without President Xi. After all, I think Mr Albanese already met Mr Xi in Bali and he's going to meet him again in Beijing. Is the timing of a reboot in bilateral relations all the more interesting given Xi's absence from the G20 and East Asia summits last week? Yes, I don't know whether that's got much to do with it. It's very hard to tell exactly why Xi skipped those meetings. Uh, I think one reason is because he's focused on the Global South. He'd just been to the BRICS meeting in South Africa the week or so before the G20. That's what he's focused on. He wants to build up. They have more friends in that and more influence than that uh, grouping than they do in the G20. It also might have been a little bit of a considered slight against India as well. So I, I don't think Australia is part of that equation. There have been reports she is focused on food security. If correct, what do you make of that given China's marked military build-up of assets and geopolitical posturing? China is definitely focused on food security. It would also like to be have energy security, but they can't do that. So they're, they are, are a net importer of food, particularly sort of big acre crops, soybeans and the like. Australia in the last year has actually been exporting record amounts of wheat to China, largely because we had a good crop last year, not so much this year, but also because of Ukraine uh, the, and uh, their imports from Ukraine and Russia have been interrupted. So they don't want to rely on countries like America and Australia and Canada for food imports. They're massively investing in, in Brazil and Argentina uh, to that end. So it's a constant focus in China, not just about whom, whom they export from, but also what they grow at home and how they grow it and increasing productivity. Yes, front of mind all the time. There has been the COVID inquiry, trade sanctions and sharp exchanges over international security issues, including Taiwan. What will change between the two nations after Mr Albanese's visit? Well, that's an interesting question. The tone of the uh, bilateral relationship has already changed and the Labor government made that clear when they came in they were going to talk about China differently, if not have a different policy. So, you know, we've got a number of high-profile Chinese-Australians in jail there. 
They'd been kept there for a number of years. They'd been tried, in, you know, in a Chinese fashion, so-called, in closed sessions. We don't have a verdict. So I think there's got to be movement on that uh, after the trip, if not before. Mr Albanese said he wouldn't go with any preconditions. I understand why. But if six months after his trip or so, there's been no movement on those cases, then I don't think that uh, will look good. Are there other risks for Australia in the Prime Minister taking this trip? Well, there's always the risk, I guess, in a sense, about how we uh, um, explain, not explain is the wrong word, perhaps talk about this with the Americans. The Americans are watching everybody's relationship with China uh, very closely, but the Americans have re-engaged. They've had numerous cabinet secretaries go to China. Mr Biden and Mr Xi will meet at APEC in San Francisco um, in November. Um, I think, you know, we have to be careful we don't get uh, 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 too ahead on our skis, if you like. You talked earlier about a reboot in the relationship. China talks about a reset. We talk about stabilisation because a reset means you're going back to how it was and, that, and that's not happening. Richard McGregor, thank you. Thank you.